Uh, one thing that still uh, seems to worry you is the um, credit growth among the households. Mm -hmm. and, uh, earlier today in the, the BEV chat, you, you said that it's not good if the household continue to build up the uh, loan uh, mm -hmm. uh, this pay in, in the rate they have done uh, recently. What, what, what level of credit growth would be <coughs> comfortable in your view? I can't give you I can't give you a number, but I can sure for sure say that it can't continue forever the way it has been continuing. And and the issue there, and that's why it, it, it it's quite complicated to come come to a, a view on on how these things go together. Is you are talking about two three years out, but when it comes to building up those types of credit portfolios, or when it comes to let's say having the household sector moving from one type of equilibrium with low leverage to another type of equilibrium which is m with a much, much higher leverage. That takes many years and that we know in many countries. And then we're talking about a process that's kind of goes beyond the time horizon that we are dealing with here. It would be awfully nice if we could do sort of, let's say, modeling over a 10-year time horizon saying that this is what happens in the short run and here we have these other things going on in the loan market uh, that, that might cause all sorts of problems in the, in, 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 in the future. But when we aren't there yet when it comes to doing the technical work to, uh, to deal, with, deal with that. Uh, and and that, remains, that, that remains an issue because, of course, we want to avoid what happened in the U.S. And, and, and that's also why we find it very reasonable that uh, FSA has introduced a loan-to-value ratio. It's too early to tell what, whether it will work or not, but it certainly is a step in the, right, in, in, the right, uh, in the right direction. In order to avoid us ending up in a situation where we end up with too much leverage in the system in one way or the other, because we do know that, that if, if you have too much leverage and everything goes in the other direction, then unfortunately it takes many years to delever de in such a way that, that, that the economy doesn't, that doesn't get hurt. And to do it in a disorganized way, well, that you know from past experience that that's not a good thing. But the hard part is really how to balance this so that you, on the one hand, reflect on and talk about, okay, what's happening over the next two, two to three years, and how do we deal with this particular issue? And how much can monetary policy contribute? And what kind of other tools are there around to, uh, to deal with it? And that's where we start talking about this vague topic called the macro prudential, which is no one really has defined as of yet what it is and, and what, you are, what you are supposed to do. And eventually, let's hope that in the future, we find kind of a combination between macroprudential policies and monetary policy in such a way that we can we can keep a handle on this in such a way uh, that when we sit here and talk we talk about the inflation projections and the interest rate path and, and, and that's kind of in the, in, 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 the, in the background but given that our job is to, to deal with money and, and, and rate interest rates and, and uh, people use money and borrow money, then it's, it's something that's always in the back of our minds. On the note of you studying credit growth, uh, I, when I look at your graphs, I get the impression that the composition of growth going forward is somewhat different than historically and normal. Uh, can you expand on that? You mean in terms of the in your forecast, I get the impression that it's more domestic demand this time around than what has been the case previously. Yeah, that's right. In terms of contributions to growth, I mean, uh, that's true. I mean, hand in hand with this strong export boom also goes a strong input boom. So in terms of the contribution of net exports, that's not so big and it's even smaller than it was in our previous forecast. And there's a shift in a sense in 2011 that there's much more contribution coming from investment than from net exports. Uh, so we re revise up basically the investment cycle in the forecast. So that's true. Domestic demand is important for, for that. But I think it, that's also, I mean, in a sense, there's, there's a sort of a 
idiosyncratic strength in the Swedish economy that you know is a mirror image of that, uh, and and that's why that's an important explanation why we grow stronger than uh, than the, at least the whole of Europe and and the U.S. But then there are limits, of course, to how bad the rest of the world can go before it really starts to show up in Sweden as well. So without any international recovery, then of course also Swedish growth would would not develop that well. Well, if you look at it from a credit point growth perspective, credit growth is unbalanced because the households have been borrowing a lot and the corporates haven't. And, and it would be better if that sort of evened out, evened out a bit. It has been moving a bit in that direction, but only, uh, but only, but only slightly, but only slightly. So, so if you if you sort of look under the aggregates, that's the picture. That's the picture that you get. And, and, and the situation has actually been quite, uh, quite unbalanced for a while now, which is not surprising given that what, given what we have gone through. Because if if uh, the demand for Swedish uh, goods is very low, then corporates don't need to borrow. But then sooner or later, particularly when investments are picking up again, it would be more natural to have the house households borrowing a bit less and the corporates a bit more. That would also be more sort of in line with one would, with what one would expect uh, uh, looking looking into the future. And also, I guess <coughs> there's uh, there has been a pick up in the private savings rate, so there's some room there for for going down and and you know consuming based on that. about it myself, but I wonder if you've been thinking about it, looking at the, the house price boom and the credit boom we've seen in the household sector in Sweden. Have you thought about how much of that could be explained through that the people are poor money to invest in their house, to improve housing? You know, sort of in, in the US you have an index for house prices which is qualitative adjusted. Uh, my sense is just in Sweden that that would give a totally different picture if you took that into account because if you invest in your house you consume it over many years obviously how would you how would you look at that have you thought about that well not here not, not here today but as you may be aware we are we have a special study on a number of people working on a whole set of different housing housing market issues and they will be done with their report towards the end of the year or early early next year. And that's when a whole host of issues of this type and many other types dealing with the houses, housing market will sort of come to the come to the fore. And, and that's in, it's, it's in that context that, that we'll, we'll get back to back to you with all sorts of reflections on what comes comes out of out of that. Yeah. Uh, just wonder when you say that the financial market worries that they have eased, what indicators have you looked at? Because uh, if you look at uh, CDS spreads and the uh, spreads to Germany, uh, we're basically back on the same levels that before uh, the stress test. Uh, how do you, how have you made that assessment, and what's your outlook in restoring the market's confidence in the eurozone, especially? Okay, first thing I think our, our own markets. We have one more fixed rate loan that expires in October. The two other ones have expired, and, and that means that, as far as we can judge, the whole process has worked quite uh, quite smoothly, and uh, then we are done with with what one usually calls exit exit policies. So so that means that things would return back to normal here. In Europe, uh, that is that's not the case. But on the other hand. When it comes to dealing with financial market issues in Europe, they've been at it since 2007 as well. Because I think that the ECB actually started lending before the Fed when, when things started, started falling, fa falling apart. So kind of liquidity drying up all of a sudden, that's not an issue anymore. How to deal with the government debt issues over the coming years has been settled in the sense that the mechanisms are there. The IMF is involved in the case of, 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 of Greece. The, the, the technical work has been done in order to 
to uh, draw on this, the, the new SPV if need be. And the ECB is continually doing what they feel that they have to, that, that they have to do. That doesn't mean that things are fine, but it means that the machinery that you need to have is in place to deal with whatever issues might arise over the, over the, coming, over the coming years. And in that sense, the situation today is much, much more stable compared to when you have this sort of, let's say, the peak that we had in April and early, early, early May. But most likely, it, that, that also, it doesn't mean that, that it's completely over because we do know and we do know from our own issues that we had in the early 90s that it takes many years to, to deal with budget deficits and it takes many years to, to, to lower the debt to GDP ratio. And uh, given that there are many countries dealing with this, it's quite unlikely that all the countries would deal with this in an identical way and at an even pace it's more likely that it will be actually a bit uneven. But, but given that the mechanisms are in place to deal with that kind of unevenness, uh, then, then we feel quite comfortable saying that things are more stable today than, than what they have been in the, in, in, in the past. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that things are all right in the sense that everybody has Everything is over, uh, all the debt issues have been settled and all the bad loans have been run off the books of the banks. That's, that's not the case, uh, but it for sure is moving in the right direction.